Huh. Yeah. So uh, we just heard about uh, how barriers get created. That was a, a, a general kind of, you know, uh, talk that we wanted to emphasize uh, to you all that um, how important it is to keep this two-way process on. Uh, and that's why um, we had this and we have another uh, part of this, which you're going to have later on, how to improve communication. Now, this topic that I had um, to myself was a very specific topic, and that is communication around death. This is when we as clinicians, we are working, how do we handle this situation, which is known as death? Death, as we all know, is a permanent, one-time, inevitable procedure that we all have to undergo at some point or the other. But it has a huge bearing on the life of people around us. So that's why it's always a big event in a person's, um, in, in a family who, who we are sort of treating or, uh, you know, interacting with when their kid or kin dies. And you have to know how to handle it. So I'm going to start with communication during last few hours. Now, if you all attended yesterday, Dr. Kapoor's uh, lecture, and somebody had asked, Madhur Anand, or somebody had asked about um, what happens uh, when you have to communicate about, you know, when the person is dying. And sir, very, very nicely, succinctly, he talked about that you have to kind of, you know, tease out there will be deaths where you are expecting death, and there will be deaths when you are not expecting and that's exactly how we should be handling and that's how we'll go about that will be the flow of our uh, talk today so <clears throat> the bottom line is that we have to as as professionals as healthcare providers and clinicians we have to understand one thing that we have to uh, provide same kind of treatment to, to the patients who are leaving this world as we would to those who are entering so our interaction with them has to be with that degree of sensitivity, which means that our uh, training in communicating with people who are either dying or their kith or kin is dying has to be uh, similar. <clears throat> the, before we go on to actually how to communicate, we have to understand that those last few hours are very different. Because suddenly the symptoms are changing, there's a lot of dramatic changing changes happening, and your assessment of those changes becomes challenging. You have to become more and more adept at understanding these changes and how to evaluate them and give the family some kind of uh, pointer as to uh, what to expect in the next few hours, days, or weeks. And for that, uh, additionally, there are other needs that the family might um, have, which you may need to uh, cater to. There are decisions that they have to make, for instance, um, the place of care in the last few hours. Do they want, those are major decisions. Do they want uh, that they want to, to remain in the ward, they want to go back home, or they want to go the ICU way. So we are going to discuss each one of them and how you would be handling and uh, addressing these issues. Most important is that death always uh, takes people by surprise. Whatever, however long the patient may be ill, maybe in your ward, like Dr. Vinita's ward, may, must have been there for 40 days. But when the event occurs, the family is absolutely stunned or taken by surprise. Uh, they say, Abhi to bilkul cheek the. So uh, the thing is that we have to understand as doctors that uh, there were certain reserves left in the body and um, uh, they were slowly getting uh, depleted. And the change that appears sudden and unforeseen to people was actually not so because that was happening. It's just that they were not willing to uh, sort of accept the change. So there, the, the the process of death is when the from a steady decline, there is a rapid decline. And that rapidity may be within a span of hours, days or weeks, but it is 
wrap it from the point of view of family. And that's when they start sort of questioning you or, or they get into the blame game when they say, Ki wo wali di thi na, tab se inki irrespective of the fact that he was a terminally ill patient or, or for a long time. But wo kara unhone, wo biopsy li, aur uske baad, ye ekdam, inki bigar gai, aur ye, uh, is halat mein a gai. So, they, they, it's a human tendency to pin blame on something where you can. You won't do that to a wall or a window, but you will do that to a person where you think you can, where you entrusted, where the patient's family entrusted their patient's lives to. So, that's where our role becomes more and more complex and we really need to know how to handle. So, before we get on further, we need to know that are we diagnosing the process of dying uh, correctly, then only can we guide the family. So the general symptoms that you see are that the patient uh, suddenly the level of consciousness decreases or changes, they stop interacting, the intake becomes less, eventually the output also becomes less, hands and feet become cold and clammy, tachycardia, the, the pulse becomes uh, weak or thready, uh, the breathing becomes shallow. At this juncture, through the help of your colleagues in the multidisciplinary team, first thing first, you rule out any reversible causes. Kya aisi cheez hai jisko reverse karne se is process ko reverse kar sakte hai so that we can avert death? Yes, that's what you need to rule out. If you, if you feel that nahi, aisa nahi hai, then obviously the process of dying has begun. Bottom line, if I were to say, is that around death, uh, what is your role? How do you handle it? Main thing you have to understand is now that the patient was very active, he said, Dr. Sahib, mujhe theek kar do. Sab, main, main theek hona chata hon. Suddenly he is not communicating. That's, that is what you are you're going to see. So he will only communicate up to a point and non-verbally. The verbal communication bit, the, your role as a professional, increases towards verbal and non-verbal non communication. For them, for the patient, it is most often his look will say it all. His tired expression might say it all. His grogginess might say it all. So that's between you and the patient. What about your the family member? Suddenly, he is not the he is not his own caretaker anymore. The attendants are. So you have to explain the process to the attendants. You have to see to it that they are on the same page as you are. You may have to explain that this is the time for them to decide whether they want to retain him here in the ward or they want to take him home and uh, let him go peacefully at home. The attendants expectations suddenly increase while the um, a patient's expectations are ebbing because he has no energy left to look up and ask you questions. But yes, theirs increase. They want, they are looking for patients who are the someone who is more familiar, who is more confident, who can give them, whom they can again, once again, repose some faith in. <clears throat> like I said, at the time of death, patient is now from morning is into a withdrawal phase, has gone into withdrawal. Family is gone is from anxiety into grieving mode or for their impending loss. As healthcare staff, you have to diagnose dying. You have to make the family aware that the process has begun and provide comfort and reassurance and also ask help the family, nudge the family towards making certain uh, decisions. You have to approach the space in a stepwise, gradual manner if the time is permitted. You have to explain the natural history of the disease and the dying process, maybe multiple times over, maybe to different people in the family. And also uh, they, their despondency, their despair, you have to say that what can you do without being untruthful. I mean, that is something that you can still offer that, okay, we are trying to make him as comfortable as possible. Let's see how we will do that. 
So your role as a resident in the ward would be to identify these changes, apprise the your seniors, and then also apprise the consultant. Keep doing this assessment time and again. Keep informing the family. These have to be short, reassuring conversations with the patient's family till the time or with the patient till the time he's alert. And keep uh, understanding, you also have to internalize the process of dying. That that's not the time when the chero pet CT karate. No, investigations, interventions, slowly you start taking a call um, in conjunction with your other multidisciplinary team members and your seniors or colleagues, peers, and the family that the interventions would slowly be brought to minimal. Some in interventions like intake output, monitoring, these things you can may continue, but blood tests, giving injectables, giving antibiotics, high high end antibiotics may not be required. Oxygen therapy may be required. So you have to see what you can minimize. During this phase, you keep focusing more and more. The paradigm shift is occurring. Talk about better nursing care, better symptom management, avoid any new symptoms that may develop. Focus more on counseling and briefing. That's where your role as a good communicator comes in. Take care of the basics, the skin care, mouth care, back care, catheter care, that you're not overloading the patient. You're like taking care of the patient comfort. These are things that you start taking care. Then you are reaching very fag end of the person's life. Suddenly you'll find that inevitably all of them have a small phase of noisy breathing, which is known as death rattle, where the patient is too weak. He or she is unresponsive. There are a lot of retained secretions. If the position cannot be changed, there is a fluid that is accumulating inside. All that is causing this rattling kind of sound. And that is not only distressing for the patient if he is conscious, but certainly very distressing for the family. And you really need to take care, decrease the secretions so that the family is at least reassured that he is kind, the patient is comfortable. Suction may be done, but be careful because that may be traumatic at times. Coming to the question of place of death. Now, it doesn't happen. That is not a decision that they make when the death rattle has begun. But certainly before that, uh, there may be a question that they want to, the patient to die at home or in the hospital. Of course, the family decides. You help them decide because always the quality of life is so much better uh, the remaining quality of life if the death occurs at home in front of the nears and dears ones. But that's not always possible. <clears throat> if the patient, that, that's a conviction, firstly, you as a clinician has to develop that if there is a terminally ill patient dying of a chronic illness, we'll talk about acute illnesses or acute incidents later on, then and their family is mentally prepared, then at home, with family, with a lot of touch, it's a good death. If he goes to the ICU care, he is distant from the family, the cost has increased enormously because all high dependency unit beds are very, very costly. Injectable treatments are very costly. All the monitors are costly. So the cost increases many times over. And so these are choices that the family may need to take. The general rule is that when we are approaching last few hours of the patient's life in a chronic illness, then low tech and high touch is a better thing. Keep providing supportive care till the very last, whatever you can do, even if it is to take care of the breathlessness by giving some oxygen. Keep the uh, investigations to minimum. Keep the cost to minimum. That is what is required. Family out of, because they are in an emotionally charged situation, if it is unexpected, if it is untimely, they would really want the family, uh, the patient to be given that 
one last small opportunity by even sending him to the ICU. ICU uh, may not be the answer to all their problems. They might uh, land up with the same outcome that is death of their near and dear one, but at a very costly price. The patient is suddenly away from the family members. There are tubes in every um, every sort of five centimeters of the patient's body. And it may be a very prolonged thing. Patient may be there in the ICU for 40 days, 50 days, any number of days, months, weeks, and he's a vegetable. So the family is cut off from the patient, is paying through their nose, but is not going to get anything. And has, their lives have come to a standstill. So that's the decision that you may sometimes have to sort of nudge them and take them in the correct decision in your wisdom uh, for the family to take. <clears throat> but having said that, if the patient is has landed up in ICU, then it is a very mandatory thing that the family needs to be after these, uh, say, for instance, in CCM, if the patient is in CCM, uh, or say, for instance, in, in the uh, RCH today, COVID ward, um, after the rounds, the patient has to be, the family needs to be informed daily. In the pre-corona times, all CCM or all ICU pay, uh, doctors would have a family meeting uh, at the end of, uh, after the round. Today, that might not be possible with the um, corona taking over. Having said that, even then, video calls are a good option for you to show the family how he is. Take that personal interest. All of you, some of you have been posted into the ICU. I don't know whether in the month of September, some someone must have been posted. At least I can say about one person, Dr. Dhol, who was our head of the Department of Microbiology, when he was admitted with COVID uh, in RCH in the ICU, uh, the family uh, who had uh, come from Bangalore and Bombay and all their, uh, his son and daughter, they would be able to see him from um, a distance with video call. At least some bit of reassurance was there. <clears throat> now, once they go to ICU, it seems the gravity is clearly towards ventilatory support. And that is, again, we have to understand that ventilatory support always comes in a limited fashion. It has to be used uh, in an optimal way so that the hospital and patient resources are optimally utilized. Family in their anxiety, state of anxiety may want. At times the family may be, uh, there may be, uh, you know, uh, difference of opinion in the family that some want, some don't want. And that's, believe me, it's not uncommon. Every family and this charged in atmosphere might have a difference of opinion. Somebody would be looking at the cost. Somebody would be looking at the uh, prolongation of life. We as doctors, especially those of us who are treating chronic diseases, we should really take a call in, an, uh, in a very unbiased way. The critical care team also needs to have the wisdom whether they will be able to utilize their ventilatory support in in a manner that the patient may come out of it or may not. A young patient with a roadside accident, does he deserve a ventilator support? Yes, he does. The same cannot be said, say metastatic gallbladder cancer. There is dissemination of disease every which way in a 70 year old. Would, if the critical care person has to take a call, where would he choose? He would obviously choose the young person who's just met with a roadside accident. So that's how we need to see and we need to, it takes time, it takes professional uh, training. It may need also help of counselors to help the family reach to a decision that ventilator is useful, uh, but not always. And let's remember that ventilators are always come in a limited number of uh, patients. So the decision towards ventilation a ventilatory support or ICU is actually largely in India 
made by surrogate decision makers, that's the family members, mostly male family members in our society. The concept of advanced directive hasn't really taken off in our society, but um, in the West, it's actually on the rise. When their young children, 18, 19, 20 years old, when they go to college, and they're for the first time moving away from family and the uh, fold of the, you know, the cover that the family provides, they normally, uh, they, the colleges ask for an advance directive. What would happen? Because people do make uh, hasty or, you know, they, they land up in problems, children. So the, fa the college authorities would want to know what to do uh, if the situ such a situation arises. Slowly, I think this concept will come to us as well. For the moment, the family uh, members decide and we can only be um, a part of the decision making process by guiding them, nudging them in the direction that we consider appropriate. <clears throat> uh, again, for those who who come from uh, you know the background where we are treating very chronic diseases, for instance, I treat cancer. Uh, this is another concept that we try to introduce uh, once the family has begun to expect that the dying process has started, it is inevitable, it is near or around the corner, we can introduce this concept of do not resuscitate, which is uh, we prepare, we make the family expect death and then prepare them towards this because now they realize the uh, the irreversibility of the whole process and <clears throat> they know that this is inevitable. Uh, that saves a lot of further agony on part of the family and the patient also goes in a peaceful, dignified manner. But not always is it possible. Let me say that in our ward, maybe about 10% of the times when we are expecting 10 to 20 percent, we are able to introduce and actually implement this concept of do not resuscitate, where the patient, when he is going, he goes peacefully. <clears throat> like I said, this is only comes in a gradual, stepwise fashion when the patient's family members are expecting. It's not untimely. It's uh, they, they've seen it coming and now they feel they've probably also run out of resources. Then that's when they uh, agree to the concept of do not resuscitate. So if I have to sum up the 10 needs of the family uh, from your point of view as a resident, be with the patient as much as you can. We can't leave a dying patient and go for our cup of tea or dinner. We have to have someone over there. And I don't mean the nursing staff. That's when a doctor is required. Be helpful to the family as much as you can. Keep them informed of the change in the position or the condition of the patient. Uh, try to make them understand what is being done and why. I'll give you the example. About, uh, exactly three years ago, my mother was admitted in an ICU. She was... Uh, in her last phase and um, uh, we would go and visit and in the adjoining bed there was a gentleman who was admitted with uh, some issue and his son about a 25 year old boy he, after every round he would come and ask me ma'am can you tell me what is creatinine uh, creatinine badta hai to usse kya hota hai kya problem hai main usse kya samjhu i would you know, that was the time when I thought to myself that I think everybody after, say, 12th standard should undergo some kind of a medical uh, guidance for these people because he's spending his lifetime's investment on his father not knowing what creatinine is all about. It was it, it, so it's just that. The, the gap between their understanding and our knowledge is so wide that it is impossible for a doctor to uh, bridge it within, say, a span of 15 minutes that he gets to talk or 20 minutes. So these are things that at least, but we should try. That's what I mean. Try. And as resident doctors, as consultants, we should ensure that the patient, we are trying to make the patient as comfortable as possible. 
we should also be in that position that we are allowing them to ventilate their emotions. After all, they are burdened with the fact that they are losing their somebody who is very close to them. Sometimes there are, actually not sometimes, inevitably there is some regret, some guilt we all have when we lose our um, family member. So if they share with you, at least, uh, at least give them that thing that they don't live with that guilt or regret all their lives, if you can help it. If they're doing making the right decision, endorse it for them. Not always possible, but find meaning in dying of their loved ones. You can, if an 80 year old is going and she's suffered a lot for a long, long time, at least you can, in certain situations, you can tell them that probably it is a good thing. There is a concept of good death. Once again, in chronic diseases, it's, it's an oxymoron. What is an oxymoron? When two words are contradictory to each other. So <clears throat> good death, how can death be good? But yes, sometimes it can be, if you, if you are able to avoid, um, you know, the remove the avoidable distresses, the suffering from the patient, from the family, it's happening as per their wishes, it is consistent with their cultural and ethical values, then we know that death is an integral part of life. It's not a failure, it has to happen. But and it were, if it is restful and dignified, then probably it's a good death. If it's given the best possible quality of life, if it's given the family a path of least regret, if it's not impacted heavily on their socioeconomic factor, then it's probably good death. Of course, you need a lot of time to introduce this. You, it, it can only come uh, at a particular time in a few patients only with chronic disease, sudden death. Now, that is something that is um, we never expected. This is Dr. Costa Mundada's photograph. Um, it happened last last month on 13th of December or something. Uh, we were uh, we were trying we were preparing for our alumni day and suddenly I got this message that we have to uh, mourn the death of uh, grieve the death of Dr. Costa, who had just completed his uh, residency. Now that was a very very unfortunate thing for all of us. And for especially for the family and for those who knew how difficult it would have been, we cannot even imagine. Bro. So <clears throat> it's this kind of death is something very very difficult to absorb. It's least expected, and suddenly there's complete the loss. Uh, that moment changed everything uh, in the lives of people around him. Created a perfect storm. Not going to change. So, um, but there would have been some doctor who would have broken that bad news. Let's take the example of, um, we, we are talking about Kostam. I don't know what happened, who, who broke that bad news. Let's take the other example, for instance, Sri Devi. Suddenly, she was found. Uh, Drowned, she was. Dr she had drowned, and she was found dead. Who would have broken that bad news? Was it easy? I think that would have been simply the most difficult uh, thing to have done in their lives. And it's because we have no fa formal training in this. At least till the time we were getting trained, there was nothing. We just had to declare a patient. Uh, he's driving his motorcycle. On the road, he's going back home, he meets with an accident, hits the truck, dies on the spot. How to tell the family? How to tell his pregnant wife that he is not there? So we don't know how to individualize. We don't know. We are, the, I think I would shake in my shoes. I, my, my knees would quiver if I have to face this even today with the violent reaction that you can expect. <clears throat> So I would say it is the most stressful thing, 
but who should do it somebody has to do it it can't be done by a nurse or a attendant it has to be done by a doctor it should be done ideally by a consultant it should be done by a senior person it should be done on priority we can't wait for half an hour ki abhi ja ke batate hain unko ki the patient is no more it has to be done as soon as we can we have to do it physically face to face however unpleasant it may be it cannot be done over telephone unlike i'm not talking about the covid times that's where people have declared over telephone also how to do it i think the only way one can think is that is supposing you are in an emergency you still should have a quiet room where you call one or two people who the healthcare team recognizes or is familiar with the team those are the people probably who you can if you are expecting somebody say the wife or a spouse to have a violent reaction maybe that may not be the correct uh, person to uh, you know part this information with you have to introduce yourself that you are so and so give a warning shot that i'm so sorry that i have called you for this very unpleasant task and then inform in simple plain words it can't be using of euphemism euphemisms are soft word um i'm sorry he is gone off into perpetual sleep that's not he is no more he has gone he's passed away it what you are conveying has to reach them that is the whole meaning so it cannot be um, a phrase which they won't understand you can very well expect people going into shock they are going collapsing they um, clutching on to the chair next door next uh, to them uh, going developing cold feet or clammy skin going into denial going into anger self blame guilt these are things that you might uh and you will encounter if we are talking especially if we are talking about a sudden demise you may need help of people such as counselors uh spiritual leaders you may also need to put in your religious beliefs uh at some point in time touch a tone which is very very empathetic is still required even though you may come across some blame statements forgive them because they are uh, not within themselves they do not even know but your touch your gentle uh, mute uh, empathy will go a long way you cannot afford to react to their blame game that is what we have to learn come what may coming back to uh, death in general i mean we 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 are talking about we we moved on to sudden deaths which are a painful experience for anybody now the patient has died like i said about the death sudden death it needs to be informed by preferably by a senior person uh, not just a consultant or a senior resident or somebody who has more experience if the death has happened in the ward uh, and maybe after uh, some chronic illness or some kind of degree of expectation had set in then do ask what they know about it and try to bridge the gap tell them about what went wrong uh, what resuscitative measures you took and ultimately they, you did not succeed in them do conclude with the patient's re victim's response or the patient's relative's response that that the patient has died and you do realize their pain addressing their emotions is very important listen to them allow silences you don't need to repeat it time and again but do um, sort of uh, be there for them even if you have to hold on for them uh, hold on to them for some time it's not a bad idea once it has the information has percolated die and uh, has percolated down that the patient has gone is no more then 
the death formalities by the staff needs to be conducted with a degree of sensitivity. Death certificate is a legal document. They will need it wherever they go, not, no, not only immediately for all times to come, because there are so many things, property, banks, everywhere it is required, Nagar Nigam, all that. Try to do these without delay. There's no point that uh, the patient has died, the body is lying, and um, uh, the nurse is sitting in the common room behind and says, Acha chai pee kya ki? That's not on. Chais can wait. Dinners can wait. This needs to be done. And that's the culture. I'm sorry to tell you that I have seen all this from my own eyes. When the patient has died, the body is lying, and the sister is having tea in a particular ward. I'm not saying it was one ward or the other. I've even seen the, the there was a time when people would be uh, you know playing computer games on the HIS computer that is lying in our watch when the patient is there. Do we 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 need to accord some sensitivity? Doing WhatsApping when the patient that the uh, the doctor has just informed them that their patient is no more is not really a good idea. I think people. We as doctors, neither should we do it, nor we should encourage or uh, allow this to happen in our ward. We have to ask the attendants to come and, uh, you know, accord the uh, dignity to the uh, body. The sisters have to help them. We have to assist the family with transport issues, not only from the ward to the mortuary to even outside, even to reach to their destination. We should reach out to them, help, uh, lend them a helping hand if we can. <clears throat> it's a somber occasion and we should, the ward, the nursing station should maintain that. And that is, I think we should have zero tolerance for this. There should be respect for the body. We should be adopting, a, like I said, an efficient approach in the whole thing do that first the if the antibiotic goes uh, 20 minutes later in another patient it can be this cannot <clears throat> the, the nurses in our ward and the attendants should make the body presentable keep the body covered as per their religious beliefs keep the body clean it should not be that there are secretions coming out the tubes have to be disconnected, wipe out all the secretions. Because it's a very painful thing for the patient's family, you can avoid the emotionally charged relatives to come near the body for some time at least until she, the body leaves the ward. Be very uh, sensitive to other patients in the ward. One patient dies, the you should look at the morale. I have often seen one cancer patient die and the uh, other people who are sitting, um, they are huddled up in the corner of their bed that day in the morning round. It is a very sad thing because today he has gone, tomorrow it might be my turn. It's a good idea that if you have your isolation vacant or you can make it vacant, then you accord that dignity to the dying patient you take care of the morale of the uh, other uh, ward inmates and <clears throat> that will be good. On the days that the patient has died in your general ward and their, your morale of your other patients is low, spend that extra minute. A touch is a good idea. Do that. It helps. <clears throat> Let's come to bereavement. Now, as doctors, our rules do not finish, especially if they have any kind of death. We should not say, Ki, ab wo chale gaye, ab back to work or back to everything. They still, there are patients, I, I, I am not uh, sort of this exaggerating, that once their patient dies, I have seen that they will come, if, if they, the patient died on a, say, a Tuesday, I have seen the next Tuesday the patient's family member came just to see that he was here last week. Now he's not. That's where, again, help the family cope with this grief. 
they might return you with some questions handle them address them it will they also need a closure everybody needs a closure you may do that more over telephone or in person but make time if you can especially as you grow senior you will need to do that we've had closures the family has taken appointment ki i want to come and meet you can i come after 5 and we've done this and they said main yahi puchna chahta hu ki agar hum ye chemotherapy inko na dete to ye aaj bach gayi hoti take out the file see okay this is the thing no i don't think so because ye disease itni badi thi it helps them so be there in their bereavement care also today as residents you may not have time But tomorrow as consultants make that time i just want to say that uh, somehow our concept of death has been an always a little different when you go abroad and you see them uh, in general i would say that after world war 2 people shied away from talking about death and globally we became death denying society but more so in india we try to sort of uh, shove it under the carpet we don't discuss we don't have the concept of uh, advanced directive we let one person make all the decisions even about our own body our spouse has to make the decision um we don't have hospices we don't have terminal care palliative nurses so lot of this role the family and immediate physicians have to take care of the bereavement of the immediate death and that's why we cannot shy away from the role we have to keep communicating with them so that finally the chapter closes and the rest of the family members move on with their lives there is a definite role of religious and spiritual teams um and a lot of hospitals are relying upon it um and a lot of individuals are relying upon it when you um, when you see people have died and the family has had difficult time coming to terms i have often seen that they have resorted to uh, very surprising uh, you know clutches of going on to a spiritual team which i never thought would be their kind of cup of tea so uh, it happens but it really helps them and we should encourage it so i think with that i would say uh, uh, generally the mood would have gone uh, very somber with this lecture which it often does but help we we can always help them uh, with uh, by communicating well we can help them uh, overcome this grief uh during the process of dying immediately after death and during bereavement period that's all i have to say 